So Doug set the, uh, the title as Potions, Concoctions, Balloons and Augmentation. But let me introduce my dream team, the ET team. Uh, James, uh, Gabby, and Daniel, and myself. Now what I'm going to say is, is this a rhinologist getting into the ear or an otologist getting into the nose? This is the, uh, the isthmus, this is the clux of it. So the principle of this is just to go through the anatomy. Everyone goes, oh, but surgery and medicine is just applied anatomy. You need to know a bit about the pathophysiology of disease, the function, and then we're going to go on to this new device, the FDA consensus document, which is going to be probably the hub of how you practice eustachian tube uh, dilatations and things. And I've got some uh, cases to put to the panel to see what they, they do and compare with what we do in England. And then the final bit is the other end of the spectrum of patulous tubes. And above all, if you don't understand me, I apologize, but just butt in any time. That's Americanism, isn't it? Butt in, all right. Your station tubes have been known for many years, and I've just highlighted some of the things, Eustachius, Valsalva, Rathke's pouch, all these are sort of things that are blur in your anatomy days of what it's coming about. And I have no hesitation to sort of remind you about those pharyngeal pouches and pharyngeal clefts. Don't you just love that anatomy? But the important thing to remember in ear surgery, I think of ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. And the whole point is to make sure you get ectoderm out of, this, out of, out of the site and keep it on the outside. And that's probably the key to all surgery. And it's the principles of the eustachian tube to stop the ectoderm getting into the middle ear. Very simple. Is the anatomy relevant to why children get otitis media? Probably the theories from radiological studies is it's shorter, more horizontal, and you can see the little chart there of the reasons perhaps why. And needless to say, just to remind people, you've got the eustachian tube, the, the cartilaginous portion, and the bony portion, and that lovely big red coming around, which seems to be more in the middle ear than probably further down where it, it is in re realistic uh, port times. And I think we all appreciate the principles of the foster of Rose Muller. Have I got a pointer? Maybe not. OK. Um, so I no, no, appreciate the, uh, on the axial uh, planes of uh, the anatomy of the postnasal space and how the eustachian tube works. This is just a simple line diagram of how the palatal muscles are involved in the movement of the eustachian tube. And the uh, tensor uh, levator palatini is by far the most relevant uh, muscular action. So going into that, we go into the physiology. I think we don't need any reminding that the middle, the eustachian tube is there for aeration. Uh, it protects the middle ear. It allows for drainage of the mucus and uh, hopefully protection of infection from ascending into the, into the middle ear. And there's lots of shape, shapes and sizes of the eustachian tube when you do your endoscopy. Again, I take no uh, problems to so remind you of the role of the eustachian tube. And if you have a problem, it can lead to infections, uh, chronic retraction, perforations, and obviously infections lead to tympanosclerosis and retraction pockets can collect the ectoderm, the wax, and produce cholesteatoma and the forthright complications. So let's now start home in on, onto the symptoms and the signs and symptoms of the eustachian tube. We've got crackling, popping, pain, tinnitus, ad-libbing here, hearing loss, oral fullness, 
pulsatile tinnitus and autophony. And that's sort of a, a process between the obstructive eustachian tube dysfunction. Should I pull it in and put it out again? There you go. So we've got the, the principles of the obstruction versus the patulous tube. And what we want to discuss with the panel is where this interface works. Coming on to concoctions and things, it's been around for a long time of uh, polycerization and so gadgets to get up the nose and move things. Uh, I must admit, when I was a registrar, our outpatient sister was a dab hand at putting these eustachian capitals in and giving a blow and blowing up people's ears. Coming on to the FDA fairly uh, recently, the FDA did release the principles of setting up standards, and it was based on this paper that was on 299 uh, pap uh, patients and the results over six weeks. Just not saying any more about that. And then the treatment of medical, and we want to discuss the principles. I didn't touch a thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the eustachian tube, whether or not it's um, medical treatment, you know, with the role of uh, steroid sprays and things like that. <laughs> I think it says it's home time to the pub. It's all. Right. I don't know how many of you read the consensus document by the. Uh, following the FDA rules and regulations. One, two, three, four, yeah. Right, it was an interesting situation. They, they took about sort of 56 symptoms and they did a, got a load of you know, well thought of people around the country and did what we call a Delphi process, sort of how did they score and they voted and they had three reiterations of the the, the yeah, clinical symptoms. And for the section on patient selection, these are the, the lists there. And what I'd like to do is to start off with the panel is for obstructive eustachian tube dysfunction, what workup would you do? What symptoms or investigations would you do at this stage? You go back. That's all right. All right. So as Dr. Ian said, a history is certainly attaining what very specifically what their symptoms are. Uh, and so going down the list, you know, if, if it seems like it is some sort of eustachian tube type obstruction symptom, I would like to know if they've had sets of tubes in the past. Do they have benefit from Valsalva? Um, do they have issues when they're flying? Do they have issues when go traveling through the mountains? You know, what medical management options have they tried and what has failed? Uh, from a diagnostic workup, obviously audiogram, tympanometry, uh, and nasopharyngoscopy um, are the tests. If we are considering um, eustachian tube dilation, um, then of course we get a CT scan. No, oh, that's uh, interesting because in one of their reiterations, that imaging was not part of the, uh, the the process. But if I move on, the eustachian tube dysfunction questionnaire uh, is that how useful is that? I mean, it's it's, it's quoted in all the papers as there, but um, be controversial. You could fit anybody into that. I mean, all right, you've got a, a Meniere's disease, could have fullness, you could have tinnitus but you might not know it's many disease at this stage. But you only need to get an average, I think, of two
to be able to uh, qualify for eustachian tube uh, dilat dilatation. So looking at those, those symptoms, have you got any other thoughts on how it could be, it wasn't necessarily improved upon, or, or, but how you could <coughs> el eliminate uh, other, other cases, other sorts? Otherwise, we're getting everybody with tinnitus you know, with a seven and a bit of fullness and pain, and you could be doing tubes. Yeah, so, uh, so as you say, uh, it's so important to really focus on all the other likely diagnoses uh, that the patient could have and ask specific questions to try and, and hone down on what actually the problem is and not just uh, push towards uh, you know, ballooning or, or so forth. Now, I'm understanding that ballooning, it's got to be done under a local anesthetic in your office as opposed to a general, general anesthetic? Uh, I only do in the operating room. So, Chris, that's fascinating because, you know, the, uh, the CMS is forcing these procedures, trying to force them into the clinic. So the reimbursement for a eustachian tube dilatation in the, operating, in the operating room is like $800. And the average in the uh, outpatient site is 3000 they're actually trying to steer these out of into the, the, the least expensive site of surgery. Which is the outpatient, yeah. Yeah, once you torture people in the office. <clears throat> okay. So, yeah. Well, <clears throat> number one, if these move from the operating room to the office, I'm going to stop doing them because <clears throat> I'm not a good enough endoscopist being an ear surgeon. I don't feel like I can do this without hurting people reliably. Um, Number two, I like them in the operating room because I typically combine them with ear surgery. I, I don't routinely do these as a standalone procedure, personally. I, I do, but I, I tend to combine them more often than I do them standalone. To your earlier slide, the one thing I would add is <clears throat> I try, so for this study, we use it. We use this questionnaire. I think it's much better for just data collection. I think it's nice to be able to show to the patient, hey, pre-op you scored this, post-op you scored this. I don't rely on this to tell me whether I should or shouldn't do the procedure. Um, the, the things that I try to differentiate when in, the, in the clinic is obstructive versus barrow challenge versus patchless. That, that to me is sort of the crux of finding the right patients. You do not want to dilate a patchless patient. You'll pay for it for the rest of your life. They'll be in your office every day. And I think there's an easy way to do that. Typically, you can look and have them plug one nostril, insufflate, and see if you can see that eardrum moving. That's a nice test for patchless eustachian tube. I also like to have them put their head between their legs. And they, a lot of them, if you put your head between your legs, the patchless eustachian symptoms will get better because you've, taken, you've changed gravitational force. Um, the obstructive eustachian tube, it's usually pretty obvious. They've got a retracted eardrum, they've got atelectasis, they've got um, ballooning of their drum because it's been so stretched over time. Um, they have a middle ear effusion that you can't get better. It's the barrow challenge people that I think are actually the hardest because they very clearly say, every time I fly, I have a problem. Every time I go into the mountains, I have a problem. But the, what I have found is when you do dilation on those patients, which actually is not under the labeling of the FDA, yeah. they're the least consistently happy. Some of them get better. I have a, I have a, a guy who dives for the Seattle Police Department. He does the, the deep water dives for uh, search and rescue. And he could not do his job. We did a dilation, and he got all better. But I have another couple patients who referred for the same kind of thing, and we did the dilation, and they're pretty pissed off. They didn't get better. And I said to them, look, you're, you're outside of the guidelines, and I think it's important that if we're going to do these procedures and they're not under labeling, we are very clear that all the data that we tell them about the chance of success isn't relevant to them because they're not the patients we studied. OK. If I say, I mean, sometimes people are chronically flying air hostesses and things like that. Um, I used to give them boiled sweets on, on landing so, as soon as the the, uh, the the lights go on to put your seat belts on, you're on the way down. You're about 20 minutes to, to, to land. So the principles of decongestants, would they help 
people like that? Is there an alternative? Is there medical remedies that you can use? Do you believe in nasal steroids for your station tube function? No, yeah. no. So it's a bit. The rhinologists did studies. They looked at how much nasal spray gets from the vestibule to the back of the nose. Yeah. It's nothing. Even head down, mecha position. Yeah, but you're not going to do that on an airplane. No, but you can do it a few hours beforehand. <laughs> you know, go on, give me, give, give some credit. I mean, from our standpoint, and I don't, I don't know, but in, in Texas, if we want one of these people to, to undergo the station to dilation, either in the OR or nothing, they make us try nasal steroids. Um, they have to have that questionnaire filled out. There's seven steps we have to go through. And two of those things which you say aren't really relevant, I understand. But just practically, you have to do those things before they'll even consider um, you getting approved. Have y'all found that? Or and, and, and for any particular duration? For any particular duration of I treatment? I think it's six weeks. Because I was going to say, for like, <coughs> standing back a bit, is the uh, nice guidelines for children with glue ear, you have to wait at least three to four months because things can get, can get better. Yeah. Okay, so what comprehensive audiology would you do? What is, you, you mentioned about tympanometry, and we're off again. So must be closing time. Yeah, so uh, air and bone conduction and uh, tympanometry, I think, is a good, good set of tests. Uh, you know, if you see uh, an air bone gap, that's also helpful to start thinking about potentially other conditions, uh, especially if you have sort of super threshold uh, bone lines, um, thinking about um, superior canal dehiscence, for example. Do you have what I call real time tympanometry as opposed to pressurized tympanometry to look at how you might get a waxing and waning of the tympanometry? Yeah, if the, depending on your relationship with the audiologist, uh, you could do that to look for uh, movement of the TM. You want to try that other computer? Yeah, but I've got all the things on here. Oh. Yeah. I've got the videos which are coming up. Isn't this the place of Apple in this? Uh, we had problems with the whole Mac as well as this wouldn't, that it just wouldn't stay connected. That's why we got to bring it to that one. I, I don't know. Do you want a new link? Um, I, the only thing I can do is copy your presentation to it's, our computer and put it back in. It's all got videos in from now onwards, <laughs> never mind. Um, well, you're not going to see any of it right now. Without it, yeah. I, I mean, literally have no other thing to do to make it work. Yeah, I'll comment to fill the void here. Uh, so when I knew that I was uh, on this panel, I reviewed the, the cases that I've done. And I had uh, 18 patients, and none of them were the same situation. So I think that's what really, really makes this very challenging. You know, they, there are so many different variables. There's, you know, the patients have. Uh, different complaints, they've had different otologic history, they have different um, um, allergy presentations, um, they, have, they have different careers, you know, which may play roles, um, they play different sports, um, they have different anatomy. And so when I was reviewing, you know, reviewing the cases, the, yeah, as Daniel said, the majority of them were done uh, in combination with another procedure, which if it's done with another procedure, how do you tell if it's successful? And so it's, it's really, really hard to, to follow these patients. But um, I think probably the biggest thing that we all worry about is patchless, and I totally agree with that. And, and two of my patients did at patchless, and, and he's right. It's really hard, and, and then, then you have yourself a, a whole other problem. So um, I, I'm definitely curious about the procedure. I'm, I'm definitely interested in, in doing them, um, but I'm, I'm a little cautious. Not 
Yeah, I think the, a, a trial myringotomy is a great option. And in particular, one of my patients we did a trial myringotomy on who had normal audiogram, normal TIMS, normal, phas- normal nasal pharyngoscopy. And, I, and you know, he, he was interested. And so I said, well, let's just try that myringotomy. And he loved it, of course, right? Which makes no sense. Um, but it worked. And then we did the eustachian tubulation. And he, I recently saw him after a year, and he's happy. But again, that's patient of one, right? So um, again, it's very challenging. And so to answer your question, no, I'm not opposed to trial myringotomy. Well, I can see the slide. Um, going on, it was basically, I was showing you a slide of a normal ear. But they've got some of the symptoms. So if you've got a person who does a lot of flying, and you've done the medications, would you put a tube in, or do you put a tube in ballooning? What would be sort of the normal process now? And how many times would you do tube dilatation if it didn't work the first time? If they're okay with uh, you know not diving, uh, I try and talk them into a tube if they're a frequent flyer, because it just uh, the chance they're going to be happy I don't is think so it's high. Matter. Yeah. Tube under local anesthetic, or okay. yeah, I mean you could just do it at that clinic visit, then they're they're good to go. Yeah. Okay. Um, the oh, the next situation. I had a nice little video of somebody with a nice glue ear with retraction, and oh, yep. This right here. Yep, that's a video. Thank you. Yay. <clears throat> so, this, this is a lady, she's really giving it some welly, you can see a nice retraction onto the long process, nothing is moving, she's reasonably fit, but she's 77, and what would you plan to do in this one regarding your station tube, clearly your station tube dysfunction on this one. So it's a little hard to see from the video. There's no movement at all. That I see, but <clears throat> is there any middle ear space or is the drum just on the promontory? It's just on the promontory, yeah. yeah. So if I see this patient, because I'm not doing dilations in clinic, if I see this patient in clinic, and there's a little bit of middle ear pneumatization that I can get a tube in, I will try that while they're just sitting in the chair because at least I can give them immediate relief. Um, Some of these are, and again, it's hard to tell, but some of these drums are just so atelectatic that there's not even a space to put a tube. And those, I think, are fantastic candidates for balloon. And those are the ones I really try to push towards balloon. Frankly, for someone like this, again, though, to my earlier point, I would take this one to the OR, do a balloon, and a cartilage-embedded tympanostomy tube. Because my feeling is the balloon may, you know, the data is pretty good to a year, 60% up to a year. But I don't think anyone really knows what happens after a year. To me, a cartilage-embedded tympanostomy tube is a lifelong solution. And the balloon will help once that tube if it does extrude, extrudes. So we have things called goody T tubes, the ones that with the expanding legs out, <clears throat> like a long-term tube. Yeah, but I'll put it in cartilage. So right. I'll, I'll put the tube into cartilage and then make a perforation and put the tube through the drum with the cartilage in the middle ear so the tube stays for indefinite amounts of years. Could you do something more minor and just do myringotomy, suck out the fluid and do it? a tube at the same time, maybe in the office procedure, could that? Absolutely, yeah, anybody? <clears throat> absolutely. So, yeah. So I would venture that we might have a discussion with the patient and give them some other options, because in my experience, sometimes when I put a tube in an adelectatic drum of a 77 year old, um, sometimes they might get a perforation. I mean, they don't always tolerate uh, a T-tube
Okay, right. I, I think the hearing loss you're going to get from a small perforation is less than the hearing loss from a socked in blue ear. <clears throat> so I always talk about all of them, but if the patient wants, if their primary goal is to hear better, I think you got to take the fluid out one way or another. There's some patients who are so happy with the tube, but then yes, there are the patients who you put the tube in, the next thing you know, you, there's a draining ear or a perforation or something like that, where then uh, really regret it. So as you said, having the conversation with the patient is so important to understand what their goals are. Uh, you know, if it's a five, four or five hour drive, as it can be, to the office, and you do something that now has complications where they're having to come back frequently, that could be a, a huge um, detriment to the patient. I might be doing something wrong in my documentation, but I find it extremely difficult to get these in approved by insurance. And so it's an option where if it starts to go down that road and that it could delay the surgery indefinitely uh, until we get in, you know, between getting the appeal process and stuff. So I don't necessarily try and time the ear surgery to the balloon. Okay. I would, would base it on, on the nasal pharyngoscopy. So if, if they have a failed tympanoplasty and we're going to do a revision, um, if there's moderate to severe edema, I would do it at that time. Probably just quickly go to the other end of the, uh, the spectrum. I'll put, so what features would you consider diagnostic of a patulous tube? I mean, we talked about autophony. Is that a, a clear-cut symptom? Uh, so the question is, is autophony a, a um, confirmatory symptom of patchless station tube? Is that correct? Yep. Yeah. So um, no, uh, because certainly it could be superior canal dehiscence. So if, you know, if a patient uh, has these symptoms and they're interested in intervention and they want to know more information, I certainly wouldn't do anything prior to getting a CAT scan. Okay. In the, um, the wind-ups to the uh, consensus, they've, they've talked about limiting decongestants, caffeine, hydration, and medicated nasal drops. Any thoughts of the concoctions of that the role of limiting people to make sure they're, they're well hydrated? And the other one is obviously weight loss, the Sosterman's fat pad, pregnancy changes. Or if you have people, say, with uh, cancer, you know, with acute weight loss, what, what sort of remedies can you offer people with a patulous tube? Well, it does seem to make sense to stop things that are decongesting the, uh, the, the eustachian tube orifice. So I try and take the patients off. Sometimes they're on uh, very thorough uh, antihistamine nasal and, uh, and steroid sprays. Um, and then I, uh, and I guess I won't go into the treatment beyond that. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I hate patchless eustachian tube. <laughs> I, I think you really have to identify it ahead of time with some of those tests that we've talked about. There are some people out there, I don't do them, but I know there are some people doing injections around the fossa. There are people taking a laser and kind of roughing up the area to try to get some scarring. I don't do them again. I'd love to know if anyone out there is doing those things, if any of you guys are doing those things. So. People are doing stuff. I have not been impressed with what I've heard about it working. Um, I, I was trying to do a quote on a Japanese paper. They're putting plugs, plugs up, and then put, uh, permeatal uh, plugging the eustachian tube, uh, rather like if you're doing a, a, a canal, a blind sack, or something like that. I think that's radical. Well, I, uh, I usually start them on, um, I'll try them on drops. So uh, the patulin drops uh, that we have here, and then, um, uh, and then uh, Premarin drops, so estrogen drops to try and increase this or lead to some mucosal thickening. And then if that doesn't work, I either refer them to Dr. Zeitler. <laughs> All of them. I assume that I think topical treatments are an option, but that's, it's really tough to have to do that every day or even multiple times a day. So I, I'm with you. I'm, I'm not excited about doing these procedures either. Um, 
I'm not going to advertise that I'm going to do them. <laughs> uh, but I certainly feel for these patients. And uh, if there's anything we can do to help them, I, I just have an honest conversation with them. And if they want to go to the extent of considering interventional options, we can talk about it. I've only had one experience that had a dramatic effect. It's a lady with bilateral cochlear implants. And because there's so much easy communication, she's getting pneumoceles around her implant because obviously the mucosa goes to the silicon. It doesn't bond into it. And she was getting, every time she sneezed, her head would go, put it down. So we put the tubes in just to, you know, the reverse of, you know, the eustachian obstructive. You put a tube into the patulus, you put a tube in. So it depends on what's, what's going on. I think, uh, sorry for the, uh, <laughs> the technical issues, but uh, we'll move on for that.